One point I want to make is that we've heard from two societies that are large and have large publication staff. Um, that's not so common. And it's my, you know, I've kind of made a career out of disabusing librarians of generalizations about publishers and vice versa, but I'm going to make some generalizations. Um, that small societies that may have a staff of 10 of which one does publishing or you know medium-sized societies may have a staff of 20 with two people doing publishing they very frequently do not self-publish as these two societies do they end up publishing through a commercial publisher um, Elsevier, Springer, you know half of the Elsevier and Springer publications are on behalf of societies. All of Blackwell was. So when Wiley bought Blackwell, it sort of raised the, the proportion of Blackwell titles that are society published. So that's kind of another context for society publishing um, that I just wanted to get on the table and make sure that people are aware of. Okay, um, returning to questions for our panelists. Anybody? Hillary. My question is uh, about what kind of feedback you've gotten both from your members and from the editors of your journals about your efforts to go open access. Are they in favor of it generally or do they have concerns and if so how are those addressed? Well, uh, we didn't tell them. We didn't t say that we were doing things because of open access or because of uh, some uh, you know, idea of the moment kind of a thing in scholarly communications. Uh, when we went online, when we went uh, green back in 1994, we didn't say we were doing it because it was green or open access. We said we were doing it because it was what that community wanted to do. <coughs> when we did the uh, special topics, accelerators and beams, uh, we did that because it was what the community wanted to do. So all of our open access initiatives have been directed by the community uh, as a means of publishing, not as a means of uh, you know, whatever the uh, current banner ads are for open access. Uh, the, uh, talking with my librarian friends uh, and we talk I mean we we have librarian focus groups we go around and we you know we have a lot, lot of librarians with us as well as the members uh, there is some concern about the cost and we address that by lowering our cost as much as possible and people seem to understand that uh, so I don't, I don't think open access is the goal Okay, and I never talk about it as the goal. I talk about uh, wide dissemination and connectivity of content and reusing content. And, that, and so far, our membership has been very much in support of that, or not. I mean, but no one has come forward. I haven't seen any Fox News articles saying that uh, you know, these guys are destroying. I mean, I was told that in 1994, but not now. And uh, so, uh, I'll leave Kent. Sure, for... It is on, you just have to put it right. Oh, okay. Um, for, for us, the, the, um, there's the peer review side of things, uh, where the, the editors are, and then there's the production side, which is what we do at 45 Beacon Street in Boston. And there's, there's really, n we don't have any jurisdiction over the peer review, nor should we, and, and uh, the... the um, the peer review side has a lot to say about our production, but um, they can't really dictate to us. So we make these kinds of decisions um, in combination with our council, which is our governing body, and uh, the Publications Commission, which represents the peer review side, has been very, uh, very welcoming as far as these kinds of moves have, have gone. So. Uh, that really hasn't been an issue. Uh, I suppose if they had objected, uh, you know, that we would have gone down, it would, would, would have been a different road, but everybody's on board, so that helps. Another question? Yes.
Yes, I just had a decision about um, decisions to participate in Portico or Locks. Well, uh, APS has been a member of Portico from the beginning. Uh, we are not quite sure. Well, I mean, we keep talking with Locks and having, or Clocks, or whatever the current version is. We haven't uh, made a decision to go in that route. Our content is available from, we have four sites, or three sites, where our content is hosted. Uh, one in San Francisco, one in New York City, and one out in Long Island. Uh, it's our intent that should uh, APS go out of business, we would just make them open. Uh, the uh, content that we ought, I mean, if you ever looked at Portico, the content that's archived in Portico is basically a copy of the article. The content that's on our site has all the interconnectivity, the semantic taggings, the backward forward sideways linkings, and, and all, all other stuff. Uh, we feel that the content that we maintain is a lot more robust uh, in terms of availability and deliverability and usability than, uh, than an archival PDF sitting down in Portico. Yeah, we're in Portico because it's prudent and it's a good backup plan. Uh, but we're committed to uh, wide availability, uh, and in the unlikely event of a water landing, uh, we will uh, make the content open. If we're not there already, we're going to, then who's, who's going to pay to keep it there? But, you know, one step at a time. And a AMS is a member of uh, Portico and Locks, and we're thinking about clocks and other things that rhyme with locks. Bagels. Yeah, and as you know, they are very different models. Portico deconstructs and saves pieces, and clocks is more like what APS does. It's the full functionality. So, um, another question. Hang on. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, my question has to do with a, um, an initiative called COPE, the Compact for Open Access Publishing Equity, which is an initiative, as many of you probably know, where institutions wish who, that wish to provide an incentive for their faculty to publish in open access journals agree to support the author fees for those um, faculty to publish in journals that are completely open access. So at my institution at Dartmouth, um, the library and the provost, there is a fund that will pay the author fees for faculty who publish in entirely open access journals. One of the limitations, however, is that the entire journal needs to be open access so that journals that provide an author choice model where the author can pay a fee and that single article will be open access are not eligible. So there is a, there is a bit of tension there around that. Um, and I understand some of the justification on the part of the COPE institutions um, for, for structuring the support in that way. But I wondered if, if the society publishers would speak a little bit about, um, did you consider uh, was was that something that you took under consideration as you decided? I know that you said you were um, moving towards an author choice model for some of the AMS journals, um, and I wondered if the COPE um, initiative, where the stipulation is that the journal needs to be entirely open access, came into your um, deliberations at all. Well, that that hasn't. Uh, come up, what has come up is authors have said that, uh, you know, they'd like to submit um, to our journals, but their their article must be open access. So uh, we, we haven't run into a situation where an author has come, come to us and we, we'd publish with you if you were entirely open access. It's, it's, it's been the, it's been the individual author. Now, there may be some pressure uh, coming as far 
far as that as that goes. And then that, as you say, that's where the, the tension is because, um, and as Bob said, you know, somebody has to pay the bills. So it, it, for us to do that, we're just going to have to figure out a, a, a model that works so that we can do that. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I could add to that. Uh, we, we have three fully open access journals. One wouldn't apply to COPE at all because it's really funded by accelerated by laboratories. Uh, we have one uh, education research that, that which is a limited set of physicists involved in education on physics uh, that could apply. Uh, we came out with a new journal just recently called Physical Review X, which is a wider version. Again, that's fully gold open access and would apply. However, the other journals, and as you may remember from my presentation, we published 18,816 articles in 2010. Out of that, there were maybe, I'm making this number up because I don't really know it off the top of my head, 30 that were gold or were fully open access articles. To take the remainder of that in a worldwide basis, I mean, given that our content uh, is submitted from all over the planet, I mean, a third, a third, a third, you know, I sound like a presidential candidate, but a, a, a third from the U.S., North America, a third from Europe, a third from uh, uh, Asia, and then the other third, I know I sound like uh, Cotswold, comes from, uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, getting that into supporting a fully gold open access journal is a challenge. And we believe that you cannot just say that our articles, our journals are just gold open access right now. We can't do it. I mean, uh, we're talking to what, going back to what October said, uh, we have a large staff doing the journals. On Long Island, there's well over 170 people dedicated to editorial process, peer review process, uh, support structure. I have an IT staff of 26 people. Uh, our content is scattered around. I mean, we, it's, we have multiple sites for service, but we manage it all. Uh, we need some degree of sustainability to keep that going. Uh, plus, we have 40 remote editors, so we have a large that are paid. So uh, it's big, and taking the whole thing and switching it from, uh, you know, Fox News to NPR is uh, not going to work right away. We'd like to, but well. I want to thank our speakers again. We're going to break a little bit early, so we'll have more time for our next panel. And we'll be hearing from them at the very end when we all have all five of our speakers. So, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great.